G'day folks, welcome to this uh, wrap up and review of Baptism by Fire, DNC Design by Multiman Publishing, part of the Battalion Combat series, the second title in that BCS series. This one focuses on the fighting around um, Catherine Pass and City Bouzid and beyond throughout mid February 1943. It pits uh, the Germans on the offensive against a combined Allied force, mainly uh, American infantry. Um, of the 1st Infantry Division, the 34th Infantry Division, various other elements scattered throughout, various task force, armoured combat commands and the like. Um, it is a, a great introduction to the Battalion Combat series. The, the first scenario, scenario 5.2 that I played, was sort of getting to grips with the one-map scenario. Um, the whole game has relatively low counter density. In fact, the series has low stacking density. There is generally a maximum of two units per hex, so you don't have massive stacks to, to sort through. There are quite a few administrative counters, but they're not ten, they tend not to be in those stacks. Basically, within a stack you'll have a unit and then a, a, it's loss counter. Um, typically that'll be it. So it's very easy to get a, a, sort of a view of the situation at the glance. Administrative counters on headquarters is a completely separate issue, which I'll talk about in a moment. That is more problematic, uh, but I'll talk about that something separately. To get a look at your combat units, to see what's going on with combat, it, it's pretty nice. Low counter density, um, pretty much two main attack routes. So you don't have to make, it's two points I want to make, you don't have to make a lot of um, complex strategic planning decisions. You either follow the North Road or the West Road or both simultaneously really is what you want to do. Um, and, and that's it. The road through Catherine Pass and splits left and, and right. Depending on what the German victory condition is, they draw a counter to determine a victory condition. If they're going left, they go left. They want to go right, they go right. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, uh, you're not making too complex decisions. That's great for learning the system. It meant that I was really focused on developing my understanding of the rules, developing my understanding of how things work. Low counter density means there's not a lot going on. There's not a lot of <laughs> massive complex road networks um, to have to worry about whilst learning the rules. It was a very nice introduction to, um, to the system. Um, what is the system like? It focuses your, your attention on um, supply routes having healthy supply routes, keeping formations together and enabling them to activate. So at the start of every um, turn, the active player will activate a formation. That formation will make a, a formation activation roll called a snafu roll. And they consider all these factors, whether they're drawing supply along a healthy road, whether they're mixing with other formations, whether their supply trains have moved, um, whether they're fatigued, all these factors influencing basically the health of that um, formation and its supply network, go into this role. You make the role and that determines how full their activation is, whether it's a failure, they don't activate at all, a partial activation, they can do a little bit, or a full activation, they can do a full activation. So that single role is pretty important for the activation of that formation. Once they're activated, you move your units, you engage in combat, that's it. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. But you, to activate, to do things with those combat units, you need to keep their supply network in a healthy state. And that means using the roads carefully, thinking carefully about uh, the distance between your headquarters and the combat trains and where they're placed and where they're moving to. And uh, you want to keep your formations together because if you mix formations, that's another negative die roll modifier. All these things that you need to think about to get the effective snafu roll to effectively activate your formations to do what you want to do. If you make a mess of it, which I certainly did in some areas, your formation suffers. So on the very last turn of the game, if you watch my, my session report, the two main German formations in this area were mixed and crossed their supply paths that were fatigued by this stage, and they both failed their activation, failed completely on that final turn, the critical, what could have been a critical final turn, um, and were unable to attack or do anything pretty much. Um, just basically recover fatigue. Uh, over in the west side of the, the theatre, through Kasserine, Desert Africa Corps Kampf Group and another Kampf Group were more effectively organised, had 
clearer supply routes and past their snafus. Um, once you activate, okay, so movement is pretty straightforward. You've got three types of movement, leg movement, um, tactical movement, which is kind of tracked, and then wheel movement, which are trucks. Um, units have two sides to their counters. You've got a movement side with a high movement rate, poorer combat value, typically, and a deployed side with a lower movement rate, but a greater combat um, ability. So you kind of move using that movement rate to get close to the enemy, then you're deploying these units and having them advance, typically on foot uh, or in combat readiness. You might want to think about that in that way to engage the enemy. Um, so movement is pretty straightforward. And on this map, there's a lot of movement going on. Um, some very nice little tactical decisions you're making here and there about what roads to use, how to get to where you need to get, um, keeping units within um, range of your headquarters. Um, formations must always stay together, basically. They always, each headquarters will have a, a range and all units must stay within the range of, of the headquarters. Um, once you engage with the enemy, this is where things start to get a little bit complex. Um, this uses a combat differential system. Attacker strength, including a lot of modifiers, versus defender strength, um, creating a differential, which is a dice rock modifier. You roll two dice and consult a, a, a very nice, simple series of charts, depending on what type of combat it is. If it is armoured vehicle versus armoured vehicle, it, it may, may be uh, an engagement type of combat. And the modifiers are relatively low. It is just the armour value strength of that unit, its action rating, versus the armour value strength of the opponent and their action rating with the modifier. Roll two dice to determine the outcome. Regular attacks by infantry, this is where on the ground trying to seize territory, are a little bit more complicated mainly in terms of the modifiers that apply. And you need to really be mindful of these modifiers again. So you're thinking not just about bringing the infantry to the front and then attacking, but how can I get the best modifiers for my attack? You're looking for every little plus one, plus two modifier. If you bring artillery to the combat, it may be plus two, plus one if it's a shock combat. Um, if you have assistance from another unit, plus one. If you have relevant support, plus one. All these little things add up. Um, and you can get some considerable dire modifiers if you can bring artillery, support, um, assistance, um, if it's perhaps in key terrain that suits your attackers, um, if the defender is weak, if you've got a good action rating unit and so forth. All these little modifiers add up. And you're trying to get the best modifier. Um, then you look at the, you make your die roll, you add the modifier, you look at the results, and the results are often uh, situational. If the defender is in what's called a prepared defense, they really mitigate those losses. They mitigate the damaging effects of combat. They cancel retreats and take a step loss instead. They can often cause the attacker to cause step losses if they're in that prepared defense. So getting, as a defender, um, getting your head around the importance of a prepared defense in a fixed position. It limits their movement, it limits their offensive capabilities, but it is pretty powerful if you just want to roadblock and it took me some time to, to realize that. I certainly grasped it partway through the campaign, but it had taken too long. And at that stage, the Germans um, Axis forces had punched through. And uh, the Allies were trying to counterattack to, I guess, recuperate some of, uh, of, of their earlier losses. So it's fair to say it is um, a, a pretty heavy game. It's on the heavier side of uh, the gaming spectrum, very similar to OCS for those who have played OCS. It is, it is an evolution of the OCS system. Um, Dean, there's a lot of designer notes. I've read the original design notes, additional design notes, support notes. Uh, he talks about the design of the game. He wanted to evolve OCS to battalion scale um, and he, sought to eventually, through game testing, sought to abstract supply and ammunition via that snafu formation activation role. All those things factor into the ability of a, a formation to activate. Um, making this a little bit complex is, I guess, the combination of those various factors. Um, there are support. Another good thing about this is, so the rules detail information on attaching support units to headquarters. Um, and it's at first glance, it seems quite complex and, and abstract. Fortunately, in this game, there's not a lot of support going on, or at least it wasn't for me. Um, the American units can, cannot attach support because they're relatively inexperienced. 
The Germans can, um, and I did in some places, but it wasn't sort of prevalent throughout the map. Again, this makes Baptism by Fire a great introduction to the system because it gradually eases you in to, um, into these rules and into the various elements of the game. Um, as I said, you're focusing on the movement of entire formations as blobs around the map. Headquarters in the middle, combat units surrounded, a mix of infantry and armoured formations. Um, moving these blobs around the map, you move with a blob to an area, you use various um, fire actions, uh, activities to engage the enemy and do, I guess, one or two different things. You're either causing combat casualties or you're trying to displace them from position. Um, and in this scenario, in this game, most of what you're doing is trying to displace the Allies. The Germans are trying to displace the Allies for, from their positions, occasionally causing uh, the combat casualty. But having said that, displacing the enemy from the position also causes combat casualties. Um, so you're, I, at least I found that I was not as frequently trying to cause casualties. My barrage, my artillery, for example, was primarily used as suppression in support of attack. You can alternatively use artillery as destructive barrages on a hex to try to eliminate um, the enemy forces there. And the best you can do pretty much is, is a step loss on those units. The um, An interesting element of this game, so units have step losses, a little, little number in, in yellow in the top, but they perform equally with six steps as they do with one. So when a unit is down to its, its final step, it still performs in exactly the same way. There's no combat modifier for this unit having just one step less. And this, this is an, another sort of abstract way to represent the deterioration of their fighting quality, not necessarily the loss of, of men and material, but just, I guess, morale. And once they reach zero, they're done as a fighting force, not necessarily eliminated, but just refusing to fight anymore. Um, so that's, that's kind of a way to think about steps. They're not, as I said, the loss of men, but the loss of um, fighting capacity. Um, yeah, so there's artillery. Every headquarters has kind of an intrinsic artillery point value. It's basically how many artillery points they can spend. In this game, there are air units. You roll for air at the start of each turn, and these can be used pretty much wildly with any formation uh, around the map. Um, there are replacements each, each turn. You roll for those as well, rebuilding units up to strength. I found in this, in Baptism by Fire, the Germans were inflicting far, far heavier casualties on the Allies compared to the Allies on the Germans. If I look through my um, massive dead green and brown um, units compared to, uh, I can't even find a German unit in here. I'm sure they did lose something. Here we go, the Tigers. I lost my one-step Tiger unit pretty early on. I don't think I've lost a second German unit. Um, there are at least probably 20 different Allied battalions in here. And some more over here, the Guards lost two infantry battalions compared to the Tigers that got lost. Um, and part of this is because the Germans are on the offensive. They're picking their targets. The Allies are retreating, withdrawing, occasionally making the counter-attack to try and regain lost ground. But it's really to gain lost ground. The Germans just have so much of the initiative here. Um, and they're driving hard and hurting and punishing the Allies. Um, so, as I said, great introduction to the system. I really like the Battalion. Based on this experience alone, really like the Battalion Combat Series. I'm already, I'm punching the last Blitzkrieg immediately. I want to set that up straight away. So this is kind of lit a fire for BCS. Um, I'm not sure, to, to raise some potential concerns, uh, I'm not sure how replayable this is. Um, I'm, it was a great learning experience, great to play it through. Great to sort of play Catherine Pass, but it feels a bit linear um, in terms of the development of the, I guess the narrative that develops. You don't have a lot of broad strategic choices. You're driving north and northwest um, along two roads. Um, you've got a little bit of choice out on the right. You've got these roads split in two, so you've got a little bit of tactical decision-making. 
um, but not a lot. And this is all relative, of course. Um, this is the nature of the campaign. They're driving through a single pass through Kasserine and beyond. Uh, I think Dean has done a great job in modelling that, and it feels, it, it conveys that historical feeling of managing supply, managing these formations as they drive through this single pass and this single road to the north. Um, <laughs> there's not much you can do about the geography. Um, the map is is amazing it it looks just as a sea of beige but it, it's really hard to convey um the detail and and the research that's gone into this and yeah full credit to the, the map artist in communicating this desert landscape and this rough rugged terrain through this this map um it may not it's hard to capture this on camera but playing over it it looks really cool and as I said, sometimes in detail you can study little tactical movements, you're studying little trails. So whilst broad strategic decisions are relatively limited, um, there are relatively more sort of smaller scale tactical uh, decisions to make along the way. Kind of in terms of how you go about your attack. So you bring your formation up, as I said, with your formation activation, and then how you go about this series of attacks. Where do you attack? What do you attack first? How do you get what you're really looking for is those combat modifiers. How do you get a unit to assist? How do you drop your opponent's supporting AV units so that they won't have um, certain modifiers? Um, things like that. Um, how do you capture that ground? How do you do these, these things that you, you want to do? Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, great learning experience. I don't rate it as highly uh, replayable, but that's a, that's a very personal opinion. Um, not because of the system, just I think because of this particular setting um, and the battle. Like I said, I want to go try the last Blitzkrieg. I received Brazen Chariots in the post this week and I want to check that out as well. So it, it, it wants, makes you want to play the, the series. Um, I Probably my biggest concern about the series, and this is probably me speaking as a new player, is the disconnect between frontline units and supporting units. So basically what happens is you attach supporting units to your headquarters and you'll put basically a, a support marker on there to show what they are. And this it represents sort of a, an armoured company um, spreading their forces out throughout infantry battalions to provide armoured support for all the infantry in that division, for example. This basically means with this support that that entire formation has armoured support, um, which provides an armoured zone of control um, and armoured modifiers and various other sort of considerations. It's um, this, this support marker is placed near the headquarters on the map, fanned out so that's visible. My concern as a, as a relative new player was it's, it was often, I often missed it basically. I often forgot there was support there. So you're going through all these modifiers for combat, um, artillery support, assistance, you know, a dual objective area, all these things. And you often just, I, it was the easiest thing to miss. And I missed it a couple of times, I'm sure. Because whilst combat might be taking place sort of in a certain area, the headquarters are often five, six, seven, eight hexes behind and there's a lot of intervening units in between and you just don't notice that support. Uh, and yeah, so it, it also, in addition to that, it, it creates, um, it becomes a bit chaotic keeping track of these counters. So you've got a headquarter unit, you've got a fatigue counter next to it, so headquarters unit, you'll have a fatigue counter next to it. Then you might have some other administrative markers like a prepared defense or a coordination marker if they've been disrupted. Um, or um, what else could they have? Um, oh, the support, of course. So support attached as well. And the idea is you fan these out. I guess you could stack them up together, um, but then you won't be able to see them. It makes it even more difficult. So all these things, the idea that your headquarters has to be your, it's the administrative center of your formation, but 
provides some really critical administrative information that as a new player I often forgot about. Um, and yeah, look, I say this, it seems like a criticism, but it's it's just more a, a barrier for new players to have to overcome. And that's probably the biggest barrier that by the end of this full campaign, I'm still wrestling with. I feel like I have a pretty solid grasp of the rules. As I said, it's a pretty heavy game. The rulebook is 38 pages. This is version two of the rulebook, 38 pages long. Some very new, innovative, abstract concepts to wrap your head around. But <laughs> the, the key concept that I kept forgetting was, are there support units with their headquarters eight hexes behind the line? Checking that when I'm resolving combat. So the way that the broader game system work is, it is, it's kind of, um, I go, you go activations. So um, the rules include sort of options for chip draws. So you can throw all these chips in, the draw, in, the, in a cup and draw them out one at a time. That'll create a lot of tension. Um, it could be quite critical and really swing um, the, the outcome of battle. I like the system as designed, where it's one player has an activation and their opponent has an activation. Um, whoever goes first in a turn often has a critical activation. That first turn can be very important. Um, you could get back-to-back -back sort of activations with a, a key formation driving critically, as happened certainly a, a number of times. Um, but there's, there's, there's a few options there to, to change things up. Um, look, so bringing this all together, this is a, a very good introduction to the series. If you're looking to explore BCS, then Baptism by Fire is a, is a great starting point. Um, I can't say that it is highly replayable, but it is a good gaming experience. Uh, if you're interested in sort of North Africa campaign, Catherine Pass, this, this really captures the feeling of the situation. It really puts you into the mindset of sort of a commander, needing to consider supply paths, and you can't just send formations driving out and expecting them to have supply. Um, you need to protect your supply routes, um, and maintain healthy supply routes, maintain the fatigue of your formation um, and their materials to get the job done. Uh, yeah, it is a very different type of game. It's really the closest comparison, as I said, is, is OCS. Um, but yeah, this certainly has a different feel for it. A lot to wrap your head around as a new player, but like I said, the, the set scenarios, even the campaign, you could jump straight into the campaign, and the campaign <laughs> really introduces various concepts gradually as the situation unfolds. There's more allied reinforcements come on as the build up continues, as the Germans begin to struggle with their supply lines and mixed formations. Um, and mixed supply routes, crossing the stream, things like this. Um, yeah, so look, I, I, I recommend this uh, as a great pathway to 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 BCS. Um, yeah, that is once again DNSIG's Baptism by Fire, uh, part of the Batang Combat series. Um, stay tuned because, as I said, I'm about to set up the last Let's Creek and test out the series with the Bulge. Thanks, everyone, and take care.